Thousands descending upon our nation's capital today for the annual March for Life rally. Faith-based leaders gathering in Washington, D.C. with a message for Congress. Don't minimize the multiple anti-abortion laws imposed last year in a dozen states. This is the first such rally since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade last year with the Dobbs decision. Joining us now to discuss is our panel GOP strategist, John Burnett. Project 21 member Petrina Mosley and Republican strategist Jen Nessor. Great to have all three of you with us. Uh, Jen, I want to start with you right here. Do you think that when the Right for Life march started 50 years ago that we would ever have seen the overturning of Roe v. Wade and the Dobbs decision? I don't think when they started it that they actually thought a half century ago that we would be at this moment in time. Um, and Roe was at the center of, of this march for such a long time. But I think importantly it is that all of these people who have been marching over the past 50 years, they have been doing so peacefully. And what I found really interestingly today was that someone commented that one of the most important things would be to see a conversion of hearts. And I think that's really interesting today in, in the day of wo such wokeness, where so much is being forced down people's throats. That's not what these marchers ever intended to do. Uh, Petrina, we, I spoke to a lot of people who were at the rally today, a lot of women specifically, and they were saying that there's a celebratory feeling, but at the same time, there's a feeling that there's so much more to be done. Your thoughts? I mean, first of all, this is just a great time of celebration. We never thought we would see this in our lifetime, and to have it happen under the most pro-abortion president we've ever seen is quite a miracle. And it's also the greatest reversal we've ever seen in this country next to slavery. So, so yes, this is a joyous occasion, but we do know that there's more work to be done because under this administration, under Biden's FDA, now abortion-inducing drugs can be taken in, in drugstores now, right next to Tylenol, making taking a life as trivial as pain medication. And also these drugs put women's lives at risk. So there is a lot of work still to be done. John, uh, from a political standpoint, how do you think this issue plays overall as we head towards the 2024 presidential election? Well, first of all, I think it's, it's important to, to make sure that this march, march happens, right, in large numbers. Why? Because like you pointed out, it's been two years, right? And a lot of people said or thought that this actual movement would actually wane after the, uh, the, the decision came, by, came through and by the Supreme Court. So it's important to show a, 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 a huge amount of people, a lot of energy like never before. Why? Because like many of the pro-life activists have said over the last 48 hours, it's only just begun, right? This, this overturning uh, of, of the decision by the Supreme Court actually is the starting point, right? Because actually it dispersed out th through several states, 13 of which actually outright banned it and other states have contemplated different legislation. But now we have to move forward to make sure that these other states try to find, if they're not, if they're not going, going to go far right, try to find a balance. But we all know that six months, nine months, or even after the baby is born right. is, is, is way too far. I uh, want to get to this quickly. Uh, we promised a report card. We're going to give you a report card. Uh, President Biden, two years since he was inaugurated and took over as commander in chief, uh, from the document scandal to the border to inflation, the pop problems continue to mount. Uh, just take a look at his two years in office by the numbers. There we go. 680,000 thousand COVID deaths, uh, 400,000 under Trump, fewer news conferences, 197 days in Delaware, uh, that average cost of gas, uh, illegal immigrants, 31.38 trillion federal debt. Um, again, by the number. So I want all three of you to give him a grade. Um, Petrina, I'll start with you. Well, I would give him the grade of FN, and that's the grade you give online students in college when they just don't show up to class. It's not <laughs> an A, B, C, or D, or F. You just didn't show up. And this presidency hasn't been here, and it's obvious that he is doesn't have the mental capacity to really be the president at this moment. So, FN, sorry, Biden. I don't know where you've been. I haven't seen you. All right, SM. Uh, Jen, you're great. 
somewhere between a D minus and an F. Um, I, you know, I think just on the border alone, what we see on the fentanyl crisis, throw in the economy on that and throw in the fact that he blatantly lied about what his administration was going to be from the very beginning when he told the American people that he was going to have the most transparent administration ever. And yet all we've seen from them is a book of tales that come out at every single press conference and documents that get hidden next to the Corvette, which clearly was locked up safely. Yeah. All right, John, um, we just have to wrap it up here. So a quick grade. No grade at all. Why? Because I'm throwing him out of school. <laughs> Academic dismissal. He has failed Americans at the gas pump, supermarket, everywhere you turn. All right. Uh, he's not passionate about that at all. <laughs> all right, everyone, stand by. Lots more to discuss with our panel.